Hello and uh, welcome to, to this PDW with the title Bringing the Strategist Back to Practice, Communication Perspectives on Actorhood in Strategizing. Uh, as you see in, in the screen, my name is Milena Leibold and uh, I'm one of four co-organizers of this uh, PDW. So also on behalf of Elena Tues, Birte Asmus, who unfortunately can't be here today, and Virpi Sorsa, a uh, warm welcome. The PDW is sponsored by four divisions and interest groups. So I'm happy to have hopefully a quite diverse audience today. And uh, yeah, however, I guess most of you are SAP and uh, CCO scholars. The, yeah, what, what else to say on this? Yeah, well, just, yeah, for your information, the, the meeting will be recorded. If you do not agree with that, please turn off your videos and uh, that should be fine. At least you're not visible then in the video. And uh, as you might have read in the AOM program on this PDW, the PDW is two-parted. The first part is an open to all part. Uh, so open to all people who are interested in the topic and also interested in listening, the panel discussion and the panel presentations. And the second part is an invite only session for pre-registered participants, including those of you who uh, are part of the ECP program. All right, I think uh, enough from the logistic part. And uh, let's start to dive a little bit deeper into the overlaps of CCO and uh, so the maybe I, I tell you the communication is constitutive as organization perspective and uh, strategy as practice scholarship in the field of actorhood in strategizing. And I show you the program for today. We've invited for the first part, four scholars as panelists and all of them work on the intersection of strategy and communication. And in the following around uh, 40, 45 minutes, they will present parts of, of their work. And I'll introduce them uh, right before they talk. Each panelist has around eight minutes and uh, they will be directly followed by two minutes that should be dedicated to one question or two questions, no, one probably, that uh, comes from the other panelists. Um, and afterwards, we have some time to talk about what has been said, to discuss a few topics that might emerge from, from the panel uh, presentations as well. And feel free to contribute uh, to this Q&A and uh, panel discussion as an audience as well. Um, you, I think the, the simplest version would be to raise, raise your hand or write um, the questions in the chat that you have. Yeah, good. We start with uh, Viviane Serchi. Viviane uh, is a professor at the Department uh, of Management at the Université du, du Québec à Montréal. I'm very bad in French. Uh, I hope that it was more or less fine. Um, her research interests circle around the constitutive communication, strategic value and materialization. And in her talk, which is titled Making it Strategic by Making it Valuable, Valuing and Evaluating in Strategizing, she will address the question um, of how matters become strategic over the course of action. So Vivian, uh, I do not see you on my screen, but feel free to, to start and uh, share your screen. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Milena, for this, uh, this uh, invitation. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. I've prepared a couple of uh, slides to accompany my presentation. Eight minutes, it's extremely short. So I'll be very direct and uh, feel free to ask me questions afterwards. So I'm, I'm diverging a bit from what I proposed because my thinking has been uh, evolving since I, I wrote this uh, introduction. And I, I start with this, uh, this, um, this idea that, you know, uh, can we really study strategy, strategizing, strategy practices, uh, et cetera, without paying close attention to value and values? Because when we think about it, 
Um, value and values are everywhere in strategy. You have value proposition, value creation, mission, vision. It's all about value and values. Even the notion of performance and the evaluation that comes with performance, it's laden with the notion of value. And even the word strategy and strategic, they imply, they connote an idea of value because if something is deemed not strategic, well, it may not be centrally valuable to the organization. So value is really central, I think, in the practice of strategy. Uh, however, when we look at this concept in strategy, it's, it's uh, highly present, but not that much studied. And it's even treated as a black box, as Martin Kornberger has, uh, has uh, suggested in, in one of the rare paper and strategy that deals with uh, value. And uh, this, this, uh, this quote comes from a paper that's in the service marketing and, uh, and it, it summarizes uh, you know, decades of research and it's still valid today. Uh, value is a concept that is ill-defined and even elusive. So there's really something um, about value. It's highly present, but it's, it remains a bit understudy. So what I want to suggest in the very limited time that I have uh, today is uh, first of all, I want to remind researcher that the notion of value and values, it is not given. Um, values are made and they have to be instantiated, enacted, put in motion, transcribed uh, in, in, in action. So say it uh, uh, the way you want, value have to be made and they have to be made into a reality. So value is not something that is already given and there and uh, not to be questioned. So I want to, to address value. I want to propose a line of inquiry that uh, uh, is uh, possibly, I think, uh, relevant to pursue, especially in SAP, uh, especially with efforts to bring back the strategist uh, into, uh, into research and, uh, and uh, make this proposition that we could invigorate the study of value in strategies uh, as practice by, first of all, anchoring oneself in a relational ontology focusing on the actual doings and sayings, which echo the definition offered by Nicolini and Montero of practice. So uh, focusing on doings and sayings in situation and consider the performativity of these doings and sayings that revolve around the notion of value. Uh, so uh, to do so, uh, I, I suggest that we take inspiration from the, the, the stream of research that is called the valuation studies. Uh, and we bring these insights in the context of strategizing and around strategic concerns. So valuation studies uh, rest on a conception of value as action. So that's why value is rather uh, defined as valuation. So this is a processual and performative understanding on value, which builds on the pragmatist philosopher Dewey, for whom uh, who has suggested that values are not things, but those uh, uh, values are practical and relational qualities attributed in situation. So action is really at the fore of what uh, uh, value and values are all about. So we can always already see uh, that at least perceive that with uh, those elements, there are connection with um, uh, a practice oriented approach and also a communicative uh, communication centered perspective where, uh, where communication is not simply a, 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 a conduit or a, a understood as a transmission um, channel, but uh, is uh, where you know, or the organization and uh, social phenomena are produced. So what this, uh, this, these ideas coming from valuation studies, and for those who don't know valuation studies, I should point that uh, valuation studies have really taken ground in the sociology of finance, inspired by uh, Michel Callan's work. So there's really here a, a underlying connection of all those streams of research uh, that underlie a practice, a CCO, uh, they all share the same theoretical basis. So there are no uh, ruptures here between theories and even epistemologies. So 
uh, opting for this approach to value, uh, it implies to focus on what is done and what happens in situation. So what is said and performed as strategists, whoever they are, are engaging in strategy making activities. So those activities can be conversational, they can be textual, they can be digital, but uh, what, what is happening there that is related to value or that is related to giving value, imbuing something with value. Uh, so this is uh, the, the, the practice focus, which uh, could be combined with a communication uh, focus, because when you look at um, at valuation studies, you can really see that communication is present. It, it is there, but it is not studied in itself. So there is a, a potential to theorize communication in a different way to uh, open the black box of uh, communication by building on CCO. And then uh, this moves the definition of valuation from a social practice, which is the proposition coming from valuation uh, studies and make it into a communicative practice. So this, uh, this uh, combination of a practice, a practice sensitivity and a CCO sensitivity, well, this leads to asking different questions. So how are valuation processes communicatively produced? Who and what uh, human and uh, other than human take part to these processes? And what do these processes create and perform for strategy and for the organization itself? So this is the combination that could be theoretically assembled to develop a, a, a new program of research that could really delve into the notion of value and value understood as something that is done and not simply something that is given and stated. So uh, very, very quickly, I, I'm, I'm not sure I have uh, that much time left. It's going extremely fast. Um, I, this theoretical proposition uh, leads to opening a number of, uh, of the line of inquiries uh, so so the, the, the possibilities are, are numerous, but I've just listed a couple here that might be of interest. So by building on this, uh, this um, combination of theories or uh, of sensitivities, as I prefer to call them, I think we can uh, document better how value happens in and through communication. So which, uh, which implies to pay attention to the means and assemblage that are um, established around value. Uh, how value is established, understood and amplified, and how does value appear in the communication and how does it materialize in communication and over time. Um, it also allows to expose how uh, int intangible elements like innovation, expertise, culture, uh, organizational identity, um, knowledge, how those uh, elements that are difficult to grasp, how are they made valuable? So what participate to this process of making something valuable? Uh, also in terms of strategic uh, practice, I think that this combination of a theoretical perspective, it uh, can deepen the line of inquiry opened by uh, Gore and colleague uh, who have proposed to look at the process of strategifying. So how do you make something uh, become strategic? So the, the becoming uh, 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 strategic of a concern, how does this happen? They have uh, started to explore this in the context of CSR, how CSR becomes uh, uh, a strategic concern. But I think that uh, combining the theoretical perspective I propose here would allow us to get inside uh, the, the process, the inner workings uh, of this uh, becoming of a uh, strategic. Also, I think that this perspective, I would suggest, uh, allows to attend to how acts of valuing and evaluating are connected with affect and embodied sensation, because there are uh, uh, lots of elements that uh, are uh, associated to value, uh, intuition, feelings, acts of judgment that are connected to dimensions that, again, might be a bit difficult to capture, and uh, this line of inquiry uh, might allow to capture those elements. And finally, um, considering valuation process, uh, what they perform for the organization, I think, again, this, uh, uh, this would be a line of inquiry um, quite interesting, uh, going to see how uh, it generates or uh, performs strategy for the organization and even you know, go further and see how those processes of make, making elements valuable, they constitute the organization in itself. So this theoretical uh, apparatus allows to ask those questions and inquire the, uh, into them in a very detailed way. 
So that was about, uh, about it. Uh, that's my um, proposal and uh, I'm really uh, open to uh, conversation based on those elements. Thank you. Thank you, Viviane. I would invite uh, the other three panelists um, for asking one question. If something comes to your mind, maybe uh, some one of the people who consider themselves rather SAP scholars than CCO scholars. How about starting here, uh, my, my behalf. Thank you very much, Evian. Just just one comment here at this point. First of all, uh, I fully agree that uh, issues such as value and valuation deserve more attention. My question would relate to your uh, position on how, let's, let's call them hardcore strategy scholars uh, would position themselves against the notion of value. I mean, if you look at how people in the STR division would define value, they would usually consider it in economic terms, kind of a difference between uh, consumers' willingness to pay and the costs you have invoked in order to produce a product or service. And then you just have to kind of capture the value that you've created through that difference. Um, what would you um, tell them what value is if you provide a different understanding of it? Well, that's, that's a, a highly important question. I'm not sure I can answer that in 30 seconds, but I, I think it would open a debate. I'm not sure I would have something that uh, to say that would convince them given their worldview. Uh, but I would ask them to explain to me from their position how, how this value is, uh, how does it appear? Where does it manifest? Uh, is it in numbers? Is it uh, in traces? Is, uh, how is it measured? So I would get into the tools or the way that they appreciate this value and try to deconstruct from there to, to, to explain that, you know, tools come with assumptions, for example, and those assumptions, they enact a reality. Um, they are, there are also, you know, communication uh, involved into how this value is uh, assessed uh, or, or defined. And there's also, it has to be stated and restated and assembled to a variety of material elements and playing on this uh, materializing and mattering idea that comes from CCO, I think I would ask them questions. So I, I, I'm not sure I would have something to say to them, but I would, uh, my strategy would be to talk with them, would be to ask them questions and ask them to provide me information and work on that to possibly deconstruct uh, what they're saying or offer a different take uh, on what they're proposing. Would I convince them? I'm, I'm not sure, but I think it would be a fun conversation. That's, that's for sure. Uh, because many ideas, yeah, you have to open those boxes. You have to open those black boxes. Yeah, Violetta. Um, I, I think, can, can you uh, put this question to the last round of discussion, maybe? No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, then it's, it's also your turn. Uh, I just introduce you. Uh, so Violetta is our second panelist uh, for today. Um, she's research associate at the University of Zurich. Um, senior research associate, I think. Uh, sorry, uh, Violetta. And uh, her research interests cover the topics of open strategy, practice theories, discursive approaches, and uh, strategy actors. And uh, you probably add on uh, also what uh, Vivian uh, said before. But uh, first, uh, your, your talk is about actorhood in open strategizing from a practice theoretical perspective. So the stage is yours. Thanks for sharing already. Yes, thank you. Um, for having me. Thank you for having me included. Um, yeah, I will take a somewhat different angle than uh, Vivian on the question of um, a strategic actorhood, namely how it's discursively constructed in open strategy processes. So um, scholars and practitioners alike um, have witnessed a new trend towards um, open forms of strategizing. And with this, um, I particularly mean greater participation on the one hand by external actors. So that could be crowds or communities, 
but also by internal actors, organizational actors from all hierarchical levels, particularly lower level employees. So now these um, new strategic actors are typically invited to contribute to strategy making, to raise their voice, to raise new ideas, but that does not necessarily mean that by participating, they con can construct strategic actorhood. And um, with strategic actorhood, I mean that they can influence strategic decision making. So that um, the top management pays really attention to their ideas and that their ideas are um, also potentially included in the final strategy document. So accordingly, um, I ask, or I would like to discuss the question, how do new strategy actors, so external um, and internal new strategy actors construct actorhood in open strategy processes? And to give you um, a concrete uh, empirical example, I would like to draw um, on an ethnographic study that I conducted at an international insurance company. And in this case, the CEO selected 40 lower level employees and invited them to participate in the development of the corporate strategy over a period of seven months. So in this case, um, the employees um, developed their ideas and then um, over several meetings, um, they presented their ideas to the top management and the top management then discussed their ideas and whether they made sense and whether they could be integrated in the final strategy. And these um, meetings um, also brought up the idea that um, one could um, particularly focus on discursive practices, so their speech acts and how they linguistically um, construct strategic actorhood in terms of influencing strategic decision making. So um, what we found, and I say we, because this is um, based on a paper project um, co-authored by David Seidel and Richard Whittington, we found uh, various um, discursive practices with which employees can construct strategic actorhood. And, and these discursive practices vary in terms of how um, the employees draw on either local themes, and local themes means that um, they are, particular themes that are based on their functional or business unit knowledge or experience, so more their operational knowledge, or on the other hand, corporate themes. That could be um, um, themes related to the corporate context. So what is the current return on investment? What is the um, performance of particular businesses or the corporate future in terms of the expectations of the investors um, and so forth? So these two themes played a huge role. And then also the discursive practices um, vary in terms of how these local themes and the corporate themes are coherently connected. So how they are integrated. And, this, and um, the more they are coherent, the more they are um, integrated, the easier or the more effectively the employees con could construct their strategic activity. So the first practice that we identified is um, the practice of mirroring. In this case, the employees suggested ideas and um, mainly framed around corporate themes. And this typically did not allow them to construct a uh, strategic actorhood. So it did not allow them to influence strategic decision-making because the top management already knew about it. So there was, they didn't feel that the ideas that the employees presented were really new to them. Another um, practice that we identified that was also less effective, let's say, was localizing. So in this case, the employee presented ideas um, framed around their local themes that was very particular to their business unit knowledge, for example. So in this case, the top management could not really make sense of the ideas because it was too novel. They did not really understand the relevance uh, for the corporate strategy. Then the third practice we identified was um, the practice of paralleling, in which the employees started to um, combine the corporate theme and the local theme, but not in a very coherent way. So they did not provide a rationale for how the corporate theme and the local theme is connected. So this allowed them to um, influence that their ideas were more taken seriously and more um, 
particular um, with regard to strategic decision making, but um, uh, were not as effective as a last practice that we identified, namely integrating, in which um, the corporate themes and the local um, themes, should say here, um, um, were really integrated. So they were providing a rationale between them and this attracted um, the top management's attention. And so they were taking um, their suggestions and ideas were taken very seriously. So now what we um, did is also looking at these practices over time, over the, over the entire process of the strategy. And what we found is that uh, the employees were um, rather drawing on the more effective practice of integrating towards the end where, of the process, whereas at the beginning, they were yeah, rather um, um, employing the less effective practices of mirroring and localizing. So we were wondering why this is the case. And then based on this, um, <clears throat> we found that employees need to develop um, a particular kind of discursive competence. So discursive competence is um, here um, the ability to coherently connect the local and the corporate themes to construct strategic activity. And um, we identified two mechanisms with which the employees could construct or could learn this uh, particular discursive competence, namely, first of all, feedback learning, so that from the top management team, they receive feedback, and this helped them to um, integrate the various themes, or they could um, also observe other employees. And when um, they saw that this is more successful and the top management team was more interested and more engaging with the ideas, then um, they, they were, um, yeah, learning um, the integration much, much quicker. So what does that mean? Uh, three implications. First of all, um, um, I've shown that um, strategic actorhood is constructed through particular discursive practices in the context of open strategy processes. And um, these various practices show also that um, new um, strategy, that some of these practices allow new strategy actors to construct uh, actorhood more efficiently, namely when their discursive practices are built on coherence to integrate corporate and local. And finally, um, the new strategy actors can learn to construct strategic actorhood through the two mechanisms, namely um, feedback learning and observational learning. So um, yeah, I, I was rushing a bit, but I think I made it on time. So thank you for listening. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thanks, Violetta. Perfect timing. I think it was one second left or something on my uh, phone, at least. <laughs> OK, so I, I invite the others for one uh, question to Violetta. I can go ahead if you want. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So, Violetta, I'm just wondering, uh, you know, the question of uh, corporate actorhood. Um, I can see that uh, those people, those employees are trying to persuade the CEO, let's say, or the top management team by making those their local uh, teams relevant to the corporate teams. So that, that I understand. But do you situate corp uh, corporate actorhood in, in, in those discursive practices? Or is it a consequence that, that once they are persuaded, then uh, the CEO will pick up those teams and put them in the strategic plan, and then it will become a corporate act uh, actor? You, you see what I'm saying? So where do you locate the, the actorhood? Yeah, so you mean the strategic actorhood? Yeah, so, strategic yeah, actorhood. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I'm, I conceptualize it as and um, when their suggestions were influencing the strategic decision-making in terms of that um, the top management team paid attention. And then also some of um, these ideas were potentially included in the final strategy document. Yeah, so, so it's like two different measures, if you will. And then if this happened, then um, you could say that um, the, the employees identified themselves more as strategic actors. So in that sense, um, these, um, when this happened, they, could, they were able to construct strategic actorhood. Thank you. Thanks, Violetta, and thanks, Nicola, for your question. 
Um, I mean, your talk is uh, also directly linked to uh, what uh, Violetta has said, because uh, Nicola will talk about how communication opens strategy. I guess it's a little bit different uh, perspective that you will use. Um, a brief uh, word on, on your person. Uh, Nico is a professor of organizational communication at the Department of Human Sciences, Arts, and communication at the University of Luc in Montreal. And his research interests include strategizing, CCO, materiality and community-based organizations. So thanks for coming, Nicola. Ah, yeah, sorry, I was muted. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so my presentation, uh, so as uh, Milena said, is how communication open strategy. And I must uh, admit that it's based on a paper that I'm working on with uh, Joël Basque and Linda Rouleau. So I think at least 60% of the credit should go to, to them and not uh, to me that much. Uh, but uh, hey, they're not here. So I'll just pretend that I I'm a genius and I had all those ideas. Um, so uh, I begin with uh, three premises uh, that uh, we can see in uh, open strategy. And I think uh, they apply to, to open organizing more broadly. But here I'll try to apply this to uh, open strategy as such. Uh, so there is a big presumption, uh, I think, that uh, organizations are, to begin with, closed, you know, so, so that the issue is to open an organization that is naturally or, or intrinsically closed, okay? Uh, a second one is that uh, when we use communication to do that, then what we do is that we move information that's inside to outside, to the outside. For instance, we share those documents uh, on the web, we share uh, data with uh, in, in you know open data platforms or something like that or that we try to persuade bringing people inside and so a bit like the example that uh, Violeta has given the CEO reaches out to employees and tries to persuade them and to facilitate their their participation in uh, in some process and third openness is a decision that's made by people in authority so a CEO a committee uh, you know it's a board of directors or something like that decides that they want to uh, open the organization. So there is a decision made there. But what I would like to suggest to you is that rather than observing people or actors or you know whatever words you want to, to use to refer to them, we may uh, need to switch our attention to uh, the ideas themselves, the suggestions and the expression of principles or values, as uh, Vivian just said, and I call them, to, well, we call them together contributions. Okay, so, so let's follow those contributions. Okay, and then if actors, uh, people, or, you know, uh, any actor, uh, you know, I'm a Latourian, so, you know, for me, uh, an actor is not necessarily a human being. Uh, if an actor's talk and action matters, it's because they materialize those contributions, okay? And in, in doing so, they share agency with those contributions and with those who may have formulated them before in another context. So in what uh, Francois Corrin and Thierry Sacaster call a chain of agency. So you must look at those chain, chain of agencies. And the fact that someone expresses an idea today here is just one moment in the, in the story of that, uh, in the unfolding story of that contribution. And by doing so, by materializing those contributions through talk, through writing, through whatever today, they make them available for collective scrutiny. So for instance, if I take, I'm sorry, if I, 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 you, you just presented, so I have your presentation in my head, so I'll use that as an example. So when those people go to the CEO and present their, uh, their the ideas that they've had or that the team uh, has had, then they pr make them available here and now for collective scrutiny, okay, again. So people can discuss it, they can debate them, they, they can confront those ideas with each other as well. You know, so the, idea, the contributions themselves can be, uh, can talk to each other, so to speak. And so those contributions lead those human actors or non-human actors to say and do whatever they say and do today and now, but they may also become authoritative in leading others to also say something Okay. And so in that sense, the contribution may become strategic when it influences collective action, when, when it guides what everyone wants to do together. Okay, So if uh, it leaves a specific materialization and materializes more and more in other people's talk, in other people's actions, then it becomes a strategic uh, you know, contribution because it guides collective action, so to speak. Okay. 
Do you get that <laughs> so far? I hope it's not too complicated. Uh, so this means that rather than wondering if something or someone is inside or outside, we must think of materialization. So how, where and how does it materialize a contribution? Okay, uh, whether it's inside or outside is an empirical matter. It's not a, a you know a theoretical uh, you know a priori thing. Uh, and then rather than thinking in terms of information or transparency as uh, the open strategy literature uh, discusses, we must think about of sharing of agency through the notion of, of contribution. So, so the same contribution can be taken up and uh, again and again and again by other people. And so it's not so much information, you know, diffusing through uh, a medium, you know, like a neutral medium, but it's new materialization that, that gives it more and more importance and more and more strategic importance. And so, and also rather than thinking in terms of people in authority and trying to see who, who the CEO is and whether they want openness or not, we must think in terms of authority performance. So when I speak <laughs> and express a, a contribution, what may happen is that I guide other, that same contribution guides other people action as well. And then it is an authority performance. Okay. So, so the same teams, let's say, but we, we switch them a little bit and, 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 and it gives a very different situation where rather than paying attention to, you know, specific people, whether they are in or out, whether they share information or not, we focus on the contribution. And so it changes our analytical focus a little bit. And so to illustrate this, I'll use the case, a case I like a lot. Uh, that we are researching, Joël, Linda, and I. It's uh, that of uh, a microbreweries association uh, here in Quebec. And um, they, uh, I'll give one specific example within that. Well, we recorded many meetings and so forth. Uh, and it's a, a general meeting. So, so everyone is there and every, like all the members are in a big room in a, in a Congress hall and they are discussing issues that are important to their industry. But most specifically, it is that uh, one microbrewery was bought by a big brewer, you know, some, like a big thing, like a, let, let's say it's Carlsberg or something like that. You know. uh, well, the equivalent here. Uh, and now, but, but within that purchase, okay, the, the, I mean, the, that microbrewery had a little pub that was a cooperative. Okay, so it was a separate set of, of, of people who were running a pub, uh, but using the same brand name. And so those people are saying, hey, hey, even though we, we share the same brand name, we are different, a different set of people. So please let us be members of the microbreweries association because it's not us who were bought by the big brewer. It was the main brewery and not the pub itself. And so let us uh, as, as uh, pub members be mem uh, stay members of the, of the, 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 the microbreweries association. Okay. And so they are not there. Those people are not actually in the room, but someone goes to the microphone and says, there are good people who helped us a lot. It's especially the group of employees who are part of the cooperative who asked us because them, they still want, they tell us, us, we didn't get any money from that transaction. We're still beer geeks, okay? And so what we see in, uh, in that uh, bit of, uh, of uh, in this excerpt is, well, several things. First of all, uh, there is uh, the part at the, at the end where they directly quote, what those other people would have said or could have said, okay? And so they materialize those other people and what they want, what they hope, what they request, again here uh, for, for another next first time as a methodologist said, okay? But in doing so also, they invoke a principle, a value, okay? As uh, Vivian was saying, which is the fact of being beer geeks, okay? So in that sense, by saying, hey, we're, be we're still beer geeks and making them say that, they, they also, uh, materialize a, a value that they know that everyone in the room shares, which is being a beer geek, is a sort of membership card, let's say, that you can play. You know, okay, so you are in because you, or you might be in because you are uh, a beer geek. Okay. Uh, but also, another thing that we see is uh, the prior conversations, because they say uh, the, the group of employees who are part of the cooperation, they asked who asked us, okay? And so you, so they are also showing that this, this contribution that they are making now is also, in fact, the result of prior conversations. There have already been some negotiations before that have taken place uh, to, oh, time is over. Oh, my God. Okay, so let me go get directly. So anyways, empirically speaking, I'm not very good, but let me move. Hey, I can't move in my slides. Uh, okay, I'll just get here quickly. 
So openness is never done uh, once and for all. So this is something that we get from this. Okay, so it's not a matter of deciding at some point that we are open or closed. It's we have to do it every every single moment and in every single strategic meeting that we have, uh, we have to be, to do openness again. It's not only about information and letting people uh, in, but also and you know I did not consult with Vivian, but also about valuing their contributions and allowing them to gain authority and make a difference. And finally, uh, openness and closure are relative, and that's something that's very important. It's not that you have you are open or you are not open. It's even with the same contribution or a same set of people, depending on, on the exact conversation that you're having with them, they, it, you may be open or not. And sorry for uh, time management, I'm, I'm very bad with that. No worries. So one question from the others, maybe Violetta. Oh, Vivian, okay, feel free, Vivian. <laughs> Or uh, Violeta, maybe it would be more relevant if you go ahead, given the, that you're on the topic. Go ahead. No, no, no. I can still ask my question later. Vivian. Okay. <laughs> Since you raised your hand, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, very quickly, uh, thank you, uh, Nicola, for this presentation. I think that, you know, the for me, open and the idea of open strategy and open, of course, it evokes close, so it evokes borders. It uh, evokes uh, boundaries. So you say that, you know, the inside and the outside, it's not something to be theorized. It's more of an empirical concern, um, but it, it, it's a key concern for actors. And it is, uh, as you described, uh, performed uh, over and over and it's a question of degree. So those those boundaries, they have, they, they materialize and they have to be materialized. And so they are open to, to be constructed and deconstructed and reconstructed all the time. So at the same time that it's an empirical issue, I, I do feel that, uh, this this opens to new theorization theorization of um, organizational boundaries so so how would you theorize boundaries from the perspective from which you work yeah well i mean for me uh, um, and for well joel and, and and linda we uh, in that other paper uh, that hopefully will be published and that you will read uh, we think of it in terms of gatekeeping and more in, than in terms of boundaries. And so, so this is what I mean when I say it's an empirical issue is that it is an outcome of those interactions. It's not, you know, you cannot decide in advance that this is out and this is in. Uh, it will be the result of how people negotiate those materializations of, of contributions and how they, you know, whether they decide that this contribution is valuable now and, and it makes a difference here. You know, if not, it's out. You know, it's, it's, it is a... It is a foreign or alien contribution, so to speak. Uh, so that's what I mean by that. It's a, and, and, and so in the same room, some things may happen or materialize that are outside uh, elements. You know, the, this, is a, this is a foreign idea or you're, you're not welcome here anymore because you've said something horrible or, you know, uh, rather than, you know, uh, just being a matter of whether you cross the threshold of the room and you went in or no, or whether the data is available out or not, you know, so, so that's what I mean by that. Thank you. Thanks, Nicola. And uh, yeah, last but not least, uh, Matthias. Um, so we go from contributions as ideas or um, yeah, things in the head uh, to, to embodied contributions maybe. Um, Matthias will talk uh, about the strategist body, a nexus concept at the intersection of SAP and CCO. Uh, Matthias is a uh, professor of organization studies at the University uh, of Lüneburg at the Leuphana and his research covers discourse and communication, body, multimodality and practice theory. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. I'm I'm really uh, grateful to be here. Um, I'm actually uh, I'm actually really happy about seeing some familiar faces, but actually a lot of new faces. So I'm really looking forward to getting to know at least some of you. So thank you very much, everyone, for your interest in, in these topics. So given that I'm talking a bit about visuals, uh, obviously I had to decide for some slides as well. Although I'm usually an opponent of slides, um, but this time it seemed to seem to work as something that is very useful. So 
in the next few minutes, I would like to make the following point, uh, namely that um, that the body is basically a key feature of actorhood at the intersection of SAP and CCO that I think deserves to be explored in greater depth. And perhaps uh, some of you, some some of the Apple geeks might already uh, recognize from the design of these slides that I might be getting at this point by drawing on. Um, yeah, drawing on an empirical illustration that is kind of like a talking pick in this regard, um, namely keynote speeches by, um, by Apple Inc. that I have had the honor to uh, work on in previous years. Um, I think it's a talking pick example for, for these types of things um, because as you know, keynote speeches are events at which spokespersons announce strategic moves such as the introduction of new products or new market entries. So these are basically events at which both the organization and its strategy are talked into being. And it is also in, in, in a way a clear case of actorhood, given that actors speak on behalf of the organization uh, in these moments. So I, I assume that all of you know Apple, um, and I assume that you also have an idea of what these figureheads might say when they talk about Apple's strategy in such, um, in such keynotes. So what they usually say is that they are there to produce simple, easy to, easy to use products for everyone, right? Um, obviously the paper that, that I published about this, uh, about these keynotes makes much more complex arguments around how body movements um, shape and manipulate these, um, these types of meanings around that strategy uh, in more familiar and more, um, in more novel terms. But let's, let's stay on a more realistic level for now. Let's just look at the speakers more closely in order to gain an understanding of the strategist's body in those moments. Obviously, there's the infamous Steve Jobs, right? Um, and I'm sure you, that you've had a look into some of his keynote speeches before uh, so that you have an understanding of, uh, of his bodily appearance on stage. And as you can see, over, over the years, he hasn't really changed his clothing uh, very much. And he really wears this uh, simple turtleneck sweater, blue jeans, a pair of sneakers. So there's quite a bit of consistency over the years, as you can see. And I think that this image is also a nice condensation of body movements. Um, so what, what can be observed is that uh, Steve Jobs actually used a very, very tiny, uh, simple apparatus of body movements on stage. Very clear, very focused, very, very consistent. Now let's look at other spokespersons. I mean, we all know keynotes by Steve Jobs, but there were also other people. And let's look at Scott Forstall. He's actually one of the masterminds behind iOS in the, in the early days. Um, internally, he was called uh, Mini Steve, because he basically imitated Steve Jobs on stage, both, what, uh, both in terms of his clothing, but also his bodily appearance, and also his, his statements that he made on stage. This course of moves, you could say. Another person, uh, Phil Shiver, some of you might know him. He's actually, or used to be the senior vice president of global marketing. So one of the front runners at Apple. So this, this guy, as you can see here, doesn't even dare to tuck his shirt into his blue jeans, right? And then obviously we all, or some, some of you at least should know um, Tim Cook, the successor of Steve, Steve Jobs, the CCO. And obviously, uh, Tim Cook has an, has an own style somewhat, but as, as, as we see here, both in terms of his clothing, his body appearance, it's very similar to, to Steve Jobs in many, many regards. So besides the observation that Apple obviously has a diversity problem, as you can see here, uh, one could ask another rhetorical question. Would you rather buy into statements about strategy uh, like about an Apple strategy as simple, easy to use products for everyone when they're made by these guys or when they're made by, let's say this person or that person or that person, right? And obviously I could have, I could have provided you with different examples here, um, but you probably realize what I'm getting at. So you can see here is that Apple spokespersons basically spoke on, on behalf of the organization and they basically embodied the organization's strategy to a certain degree. And in doing so, they also contributed to talking into existence what Apple stood for in those years. So from this, I argue that we can actually conclude that the strategist's body accomplishes two things at the same time. On the SAP side, what we see is that, they, um, that these bodies incorporate something what, that, that we know as embodied strategy 
kind of a production and reproduction of the organization's strategy through the bodies of, of the, the organization's spokesperson. And on the CCO side, I don't, I don't know if ever, anyone has ever used that term. If not, then I'm, I might be the first one to do it. Uh, I would call it embodied organizationality. So basically what we can see is that these bodies of spokespersons or people uh, who talk on behalf of the organization contribute to speech acts for which the central distinctives and enduring features of the organization come into being. And because the strategist body accomplishes these two things at the same time, I argue that um, the body is basically a nexus concept that enables us to explore the intersections of SAP and CCO in greater depth. And in fact, despite growing interest in the role of bodies, both in, strate in strategic and communicative practices, uh, bodies continue to be under-researched, both in SAP and CCO research. And I believe that devoting more attention to them provides us with an opportunity to explore the interface of SAP and CCO research and, and, and both, both sides. I mean, obviously, we can ask very different questions at different, different levels. Obviously, this uh, talk was really based on a quite holistic understanding of embodiment. You can also zoom in and, and observe specific bodily movements that contribute to either one or the other or even both. So there are different questions you might ask at the same time. But uh, this is, I hope, uh, kind of a focused argument that I was able to make here uh, in favor of the strategist's body. And obviously, I'm very happy to to discuss these issues in greater depth. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matthias. So um, before we start the big round, yeah, uh, Violetta, you were the first. Um, please, yeah, jump in and ask your question. And then I, uh, I hand over to Ellen, who will facilitate the bigger Q&A uh, and panel discussion. So Violetta, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias, for the inspiring presentation. Um, just, I, I was wondering whether um, disembodiment is also a question of authenticity. So it's, um, it's more a comment than a question, probably. So when you um, give the example of Medorn yeah, from Deutsche Bahn, so the German railway company, I think one of their values was also simplicity at the end. Um, so very similar to, to, to Apple. And um, so then the question is whether um, um, if, if, if uh, the CEOs um, do not embody the strategy, um, whether that has then different effects than um, if it's so clearly embodied as in the case of G Steve Jobs, for example. Absolutely. Well, the question is usually who is supposed to buy into uh, the, the statements made by those top managers. I mean, we know from uh, research, for example, by, by Richard Whittington and uh, Bajak Marcus Douglas um, about what is usually considered cheap talks, such as some of those investor, investor relations uh, uh, meetings, should, no one really takes very seriously that they, actually, that they are actually quite consequential uh, in terms of how investors, for example, uh, consider uh, the future direction of the organization. So in that sense, um, it's, it certainly is, impor it's, it's, it's important to create some type of match between uh, what you're saying and how you're moving your body on stage, right? So authenticity plays in a, a very important role. And at the same time, I mean, I, mean, I, I kind of hinted at this familiarity novelty issue um, that uh, we figured out in, in the paper. I mean, I'm, I'm usually not really good at self-advertisement and I really don't like it therefore don't even provide it a source here on my slides. Um, but uh, the, the important point about that paper was that um, the discursive statements are really pretty much shaped by body movements that uh, create both familiarity and novelty. Obviously, if everything is just familiar to you, it um, resonates wonderfully, but you're not really struck by, by what you're seeing. But at the same time, if you, if you then create a certain type of novelty, then it might be far off what you what, what are experienced in. Um, but it somehow uh, makes an interesting point. The same thing goes with, um, with the bodily movements. So in that sense, you have to be authentic, right? You have to embody basically what you're saying about the strategy. But at the same time, um, you might also need a certain element of, of difference in order to excite your audience. Obviously, this is kind of up to uh, future research, I would say, but uh, authenticity is certainly an important aspect in this regard. OK, 
Hey, thanks for the question, Yoletta, and thanks to all four panelists. So it's off to begin with, for these nice presentations, I really enjoyed them. Um, as Milena already said, I'm gonna lead us a bit through the Q&A session. So if you have any questions to our panelists, then this is the time to ask. Um, Milena also already said in the beginning that made it easiest to simply raise your hand. So that's one way to do it. Another way could be to use the chat function. Um, but really, as you please, don't hesitate. Uh, we like to have this open and interactive. So just go ahead. And if there's, oh, there's two. Okay. <laughs> um, maybe we can start off with Renate. We haven't heard her talking yet, and then proceed to our panelists again. <laughs> Hello, thank you for um, calling me out. Um, I was interested in Violetta's study, and um, maybe she said it and I couldn't follow it, but does it mean that your uh, actors, like the employees and the managers, um, by the time had it was more important that they could have this common language, that they had this connection, and that they had this way of sticking together rather than the content, so that the kind of soft side was more important than strategy content. Yes, so both. So it, uh, what we found is that definitely the way the ideas were presented mattered as much as the content of the ideas. So, um, and that is actually a very similar um, argument than um, Matthias just presented. So on the one side, it had to be novel, yeah, to raise their, their attention. So it had to provide some, some novelty. Um, and um, at the same time, it had to resonate with what they already knew. So if it was too novel and uh, too, um, maybe also precise, then the top management couldn't really make sense of the ideas or did not see the relevance for, for the corporate strategy. Mm -hmm. did I, did so I it's a lot of a systematic process of balancing. Okay. Okay. Um, so we have one question in the chat by Maria Elisa. Uh, this question is to Viviana. Uh, and she asks, can you develop a little further how you see the challenge of value co-creating in your approach? Do you think that it will need to integrate the understanding of collective sense making? Maybe you can respond to that, Viviana. Yeah, well, I, I think it's a, it's a very uh, interesting and relevant question. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure that I would start from the idea that value co-creation is a challenge. I would see it as an activity in which people engage. Uh, and then this activity comes with its own uh, challenges. I, I, I'm not sure I would integrate with sense making, but I, I, I would posit that people are trying to make sense. And what, what interests me is, is, uh, is actually the how, how it is done, how it's performed, what is said, what are the arguments that are um, proposed, how are things evaluated, are numbers coming into play, what are the tools that are being used, how are decisions uh, uh, arrived at, and uh, what is invoked, what is amplified, what is discarded. So I would look at the, the conversations uh, or the interactions that are happening as people are you know, in, in this process. So this is how I would do it. Um, so I, I'm not sure I would theoretically need to integrate uh, sense making, but there are, of course, the interesting theoretical contribution with uh, with collective sense making that could be weaved in. But um, how can I say this? Uh, I, I think we, we we have to be careful not to you know combine too many theories <laughs> uh, in in what we do. So I would pick my starting point would not be sense making, but if sense making is your starting point, I think that there's the possibility to integrate again the the the, the word that I use the sensitivity to uh, to you know, communicative processes and the communication events. Thank you. Oh, I saw you. Yeah, I saw you nodding a lot of the time. So I hope this was a good answer to your question. 
Um, Vivian, you had also your hand raised for a question. Maybe it's a good idea to proceed immediately with that. Yeah, well, it was just a, a quick a quick reaction to Matthias' uh, presentation. You know, you, you showed this image of uh, Steve Jobs uh, over the ages, uh, uh, over time, uh, still uh, having the same look. And we, we see this a lot in those, uh, you know, tech companies. Uh, so it, it has this label of norm core. Um, Mark Zuckerberg also is always wearing the same outfit, this and that. So, I, th I think this this focus on uh, bo body as combination of uh, clothing, gesture, and signals uh, to to values again uh, to echo my 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 concern. I think it, it also has um, a potential to constitute constitute a field. So it's also creating something for the organization. But there's an echo with all of those other firms, even the constituting Silicon Valley, the Silicon Valley ethos. So it goes outside the organization you know, as Apple or you know, Facebook, this and that. So I think there's a, even a further ramification uh, that could be explored from the starting point. And uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's quite uh, interesting. So it's more of a, of a remark, but it goes beyond the organization. So I see a thumbs up. Um, anything else you want to share, Matthias? Or shall we proceed with the Q&A? Yeah, just I, I totally agree. I mean, I'm, I'm eager to also to respond to the questions here in the chat that that arise on the site. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, there are a lot of things to explore together with uh, with bodies at different levels, be it a field level phenomenon, uh, be it a practice back, practice based phenomenon, or something what others might call micro. So I think that uh, there's a lot a lot we can we can do with with bodies. Yeah. Okay, so I see two more hands raised. Your letter, yours, but up for a while. So maybe you want to begin with your question. So, um, that was mainly a question to Nicola, because um, at the beginning of your presentation, you said that open strategy initiatives are mainly planned or designed. Yeah. However, we also know of um, open strategy initiatives that are more emergent and unplanned. So I wonder how your idea about this, um, yeah, let's say this performative stance on openness, how that fits with the emergent or unplanned notions of open strategizing. And that's maybe also a question related to Vivian. Um, in terms of then how could this uh, focus on performative aspects also capture the intended and designed aspects um, um, of value, valuating? Yes, I, th I think the, one of the replies, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll begin and then Jenny can go ahead. Uh, I, I think my, my point is not, I mean, I do think that a lot of the literature still puts the the the, the decision of, of opening on, on, on top management teams or something like that. And I agree that there are some research uh, that shows that that it is unplanned or or emergent, but there is still a some kind of decision, you know, that that this is, you know, even if it is a sort of emerging decision, there is a decision that this is how we are going to go about with the process, let's say. Whereas I think my, my point is more that it is a continuous thing, is that even once you are in a room, whether you have decided to open or not to open, uh, <laughs> you know, someone can, can bring in a contribution by someone else that you did not invite and, and, and express that idea. And then it will be a matter of whether people recognize it as, as valuable and, and relevant or not. And, and so, so, so it's even what I'm trying to say is that whether you plan or not plan, <laughs> doesn't entirely matter. I mean, of course it, it does matter. I'm not saying that this is, that my idea is at the exclusion of all other ideas, but that there is still a continuous process going on and that we must pay attention also that to, to the conversation and how they unfold and how they bring in other conversations, uh, other contributions. I mean, even those that you did not intend to, to invite and whether this intention was uh, the CEOs or, or came from a, an employee committee or something like that, or, you know, it doesn't really... Uh, matter so that that's i guess my point but but you know uh, in, if you do a quick literature review at least when, when we did that a lot of the literature still set, identifies a sort of decision that someone made to open the strategy process it's it's the bulk of it yeah yeah 
Yeah, and I, I'm sorry, I, I, I missed uh, your question. I had a slight moment of uh, uh, connection problem, but I think time is short and Anne and Dennis have uh, important uh, questions. So maybe I can pick up uh, if we have time. Eh? Yes, sure. let's let's proceed with maybe that. proceed. Yes, indeed. Anne, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, so I, I very much enjoying this session. Uh, I think it's really interesting to bring these two perspectives together. Uh, I was just responding to uh, a discussion between Viviane and Nicola about uh, boundaries. And I mean, there's a notion in the literature of, of boundary work, uh, which I think fits really well with this. Uh, and you can think of boundary work as being something that is um, done structurally, uh, but also something that is negotiated linguistically, I mean, in, in the moment. Uh, and uh, I think that that would, uh, looking at that literature and uh, how people negotiate and defend and uh, um, uh, fight over boundaries uh, would be, uh, as boundary work, would be an interesting way to look at it. So. <laughs> This paper is already in the pipeline, so it's going to come out soon. Thanks for the great comment, Anne. Um, Dennis also wrote in the chat that he had a question or a comment. Yeah, thank you. No, it's also ahead. more like a comment. I also very much enjoyed the contributions, and I th think they nicely spoke to each other, even if they are so different. I think that uh, what I saw in the, across the panel is that we talked today about three different notions of actorhood, at minimum three or three levels. I mean, we talked about individual actorhood, we talked about organizational actorhood, and we talked about uh, even a broader notion of actorhood, uh, like with values and, and contributions by Vivian and, and Nicola. And so maybe we, uh, Greta was mostly focused on this individual level, also being interested in the competences and skills that people can develop to, to make their voice heard, to contribute to open strategizing processes. And CEO scholars usually are also uh, more just on the organization level, how the organization is talked into being as an actor in, in its own right. Uh, and I think Jan and uh, Nicola, uh, with their latest work, also opens open this up to broader notions of agency. But what I like about Matthias's presentation in, in the very end is that it pulls together the three levels in my view. Because uh, with this example of Apple, uh, Steve Jobs, etc., it seems to be that the individual agency or actorhood of the CEO. Um, is kind of the bodily nexus of these different actorhood levels because it, as soon as Tim Cook, for example, wears the same kind of clothes as Steve Jobs does, he kind of continues uh, these, these these signals, these values of what matters as strategic actorhood in, in these in, or represents this organization and reactivates also the organizational level actorhood by continuing that. And uh, with that, also the individual actorhood of that CEO is, is strengthened as well. So there seem to be also kind of yeah, maybe in, in terms of speech act theory, uh, yeah, performativity, uh, boundary conditions, felicity conditions, where these kind of are, are seen as, as kind of appropriate, and at the same time activates three types of actor, three levels of actor at the same time. This I found really fascinating, maybe can pull together also some of the, of, of the topics across the, the, the four presentations. Thanks, Dan, so for this fantastic observation. I agree, really nice to, to, to end with also the observations across panels. Uh, I think it also connects to the question that Monica raised when she asked about, you know, when Steve Jobs then died, you know, how is that proceeded to someone following him up? Um, so really nice that all these things start coming together so quickly. If I am correct, we are already a bit behind schedule. So I'm afraid there's... Uh, not much more room for questions. Like we would need to proceed to the second part. Um, and Zirpi is gonna introduce that. So I'm gonna switch over to her.